Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at A1, Volume 2, Book 1. Um, soon after Atomica Press, uh, their run of A1 ended, um, Epic Comics, a uh, division of Marvel, picked it up. I guess they liked A1. I guess they didn't want to make their own anthology and... They already had Epic Illustrated. Oh, I'm sorry, not then. I think Epic was done by then. But um, they uh, basically picked up a four-issue run of A1, continuing uh, all these uh, great artists and writers contributing. It seems like it's not nearly as star-studded as the first run. Um, a lot more subdued. But uh, there's some pretty nice shit in here. And some pretty uh, good names. Love this cover by Glenn Fabry. It's pretty amazing. It's probably one of his best covers, actually. So, um, here's the title pages. I could not find who drew these little uh, dinosaur sketches here. Though, it could be Roger Langridge. Roger uh, Langridge is in this issue. But it doesn't mention who draws these. I couldn't find it on the uh, Grand Comic Database, which seems strange. Um, yeah, I don't know. But they're kind of cute little drawings of these dinosaurs getting into all kinds of uh, hijinks. Contents page, and we have an introduction from Kevin Eastman. Kind of interesting. Not really. I gotta say, this is so annoying. It's the early 90s. I don't know if you guys remember... Early 90s, all these guys were trying to make these weird hip graphic design shit. And this one is just annoying as hell, where just letters are randomly lowercase or uppercase. It's so stupid. I remember there's a lot of dumb shit like that in the 90s. Okay, so we start off with Along for the Ride. And uh, this is written by, oh shit, I forgot his name already. Igor or something? Igor Goldkind. Never heard of him before. I assume he's English. And it's painted, fully painted by Glenn Fabry. Glenn Fabry, you know, is known for his painted covers. Doesn't often do interiors at all. But when he does, it's usually line art. I, I don't have any Glenn Fabry where his interior comic work is fully painted. This looks really nice. This is some amazing shit. So, uh... We're basically somewhere, I think it's like Texas or somewhere, somewhere in the deep south or the southwest. And this uh, English guy who's traveling through America comes into this diner. And there's this total, like, racist redneck sheriff and his buddy. And they start giving the English guy shit because he's got long hair. They're like, hey, hippie, you a boy or a girl? And... These guys are just total turds. So, uh, he melts off to him, the, the English guy, and they kick his ass out of the diner. Man, look at this painting here. This is some beautiful shit. He says to himself, and this is supposed to be a free country. Corn blimey. He doesn't say corn blimey. So he continues his hitchhiking across America. And he's thinking to himself, man, America is just a joke. It's just a prepackaged pipe, pipe dream. It's not at all like the Levi ads that you see in England. Whatever happened to the American dream? And just as he's thinking that, this car pulls up and stops in front of him. It's this beautiful old 50s finned car, classic car. And the driver says, you're going to get in or what? And as soon as he, before he even gets in the car, the driver starts spouting off this like crazy. It's, I don't know if it's supposed to be beatnik because it's not that beatnik-y, but he says, we got two hours to make those passos. That's two passes to you, Jack. Then Trace Burroughs, 
easy as one, two, three, be over, over the border by sunset. There's a Senrita in Mexicali. Hope she's keeping my bottle warm. You got any gas money, Jack? We're traveling on empty. Need a bit of rocket fuel to get us over the border. Doctor's orders. And he just doesn't shut up for the whole comic. He's just spouting. Um, it's, I, I guess, kind of beatnik poetry. But it doesn't really capture the beatnik style that well. So, this is my theory. I think this is supposed to be Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and William S. Burroughs in this car. Even though William S. Burroughs is way too old. <laughs> William S. Burroughs was older than the other guys, but he wasn't this old. But uh, as soon as he sits down next to William S. Burr, or let's call him Bill, because I could be wrong with my theory totally. As soon as he sits down next to Bill, Bill just says, I'm going to kill you, son. <laughs> and he keeps saying that throughout the comic. So this is just very harrowing for this English guy. Um, these guys are passing around a bottle of Jack Daniels, including the driver. And so he's just drunk and driving like a maniac. And they just basically are just spouting nonsense. All this crazy shit. They stop to get some gas. And it looks like Marilyn Monroe is on the telephone in front of him. The English guy needs to make a phone call. Very Marilyn Monroe. Except they pull back, though, and we see that her body is definitely not Marilyn Monroe. And she's actually talking to her a guy named Jack. And I think maybe her boyfriend here is uh, supposed to be James Dean. Kind of looks like James Dean, I guess. I don't know. And then we see a, a blues guy playing trumpet or a jazz guy. And so this continues. Everyone's talking crazy shit. Uh, Bill is pointing a gun <laughs> at... Uh, at the English guy, he's even putting in his mouth, playing Russian roulette with himself. We see another jazz guy in the side of the road. And then finally, he can't take it anymore. He says, I'm get, I want to get out. And uh, they stop the car and let him out. And they say, they kind of say goodbye. But he says, who are you? And the guy in the passenger seat says, beats me. Tell the Beatles they spilled the beans. And they drive off. So I don't really know what to make of this comic. Except, I mean, God, this art is amazing. Beautiful painted art. But um, I kind of get the idea that the joke is, is that he's all like, oh, whatever happened to the American dream? And then he meets the American dream in spades. It's like on the road, Jack Kerouac. Marilyn Monroe, uh, jazz guys playing the horn on the side of the road. So some kind of like surreal hallucination, but uh, almost like a parody of like cool Americana stuff, you know. But who knows? Because, <laughs> I mean, neither of these guys look like Jack Kerouac or Allen Ginsberg. And if, he's, if this guy writer is trying to duplicate Jack Kerouac's syntax the way he writes he does a pretty piss poor job of it I haven't even read much Jack Kerouac and I know that it's not a good facsimile I mean you want to see a good facsimile of Jack Kerouac get that uh, Alan Moore story in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen black book I mean it's dead on you know he totally captures it but this one's not so great ah uh, next one of my favorite artists of all time P. Craig Russell a Voyage to the Moon by Cyrano de Bergerac. And I should have looked up more about this because Cyrano de Bergerac's a fictional character. But maybe in the book Cyrano de Bergerac, he wrote something? <laughs> I were told this story? I don't know. So Cyrano makes his flying machine. After a little bit, it falls to the ground. God, just look at this design work, the logo, colors. P. Craig Russell's just a master. So, um, but then he's surprised to find himself. He still continues upward, um, floating upward. And he ends up crashing on the moon right into this tree, this beautifully drawn tree. As you can tell, this is obviously very different than P. Craig Russell's normal style. I mean, it's very similar, 
But it's very, he's really playing up the cartooniness. Look at that face there. God, just he's so good at drawing trees and nature and stuff. So he smells these, uh, a beautiful flower. And the aroma makes him younger. And then he meets these two uh, quadrupeds that kind of look like humans, but they walk around on all fours. And, you know, they're obviously different looking. They're weird. But um, they basically grab him and they take him to their city. And he learns about the culture of this place. Oh, God, he's so good at drawing this kind of shit, too. Look at that beautiful palace. It's just total fairy tale stuff. So um, he slowly learns the language of these peoples. peoples. And um, I like this how the nobility, they have a different language than the common people. The nobility, their language sounds like music. And I love this how he tries to depict their language. He basically says when a bunch of them get together to talk about something, it's like a beautiful symphony, all their different voices, you know? It's kind of an interesting way to depict music. The common people, they do this kind of pantomime. They, and that's why they have no clothes, so they can use every muscle in their body to express things. It's almost like they're like uh, modern dancers doing interpretive dance. So they think he's a total animal, Cyrano, because he walks on two legs and they don't know his language. So they treat him like an animal. They have him chained up. They make him do dumb tricks and stuff. But then he meets a guy who speaks Greek. And luckily Cyrano de Bergerac knows Greek. And this guy tells him that he's from the sun. He was born on the sun. Look at that crazy panel there. That's nice. I mean, it got every panel in here. It's amazing. Just so well designed. Just unto itself, each panel is just beautiful. So this guy from the sun, basically, he likes to travel, hop around the planets. He likes the variety. But he spent a lot of time on Earth. That's how he knows Greek. And basically says he'll put in a good word for Cyrano because he knows how to, t he can talk to these uh, moon people. He knows their language. There's all this great little commentary. I mean, this was obviously written as a satire where um, Cyrano is complaining that he can't believe how he's been treated since he's been there. He says, yeah, if one of these people came to my planet, to Earth, he would be far better received. And the sun guy says, I doubt it. Your men of science would have killed him and stuffed him by now. Which rings true. So, uh, he goes to meet the king. And before, I'm sorry, before he actually meets the king, though, he has his first meal on the moon, which they don't eat things. They don't ingest things. They they basically ingest aromas. They just have all these different jars of food, and you just smell them. That's how you eat. And, of course, Cyrano is all like, I'm going to starve to death like that. It's like, no, I'll give it a try. And it actually fills his belly. So this is like basically the moon is like upside down land. You know, everything's different. Everything's the opposite. So the Cyrano has learned enough of the language that he uh, speaks in it, the musical language, to the king. Everyone's freaked out. It's like that scene in Planet of the Apes. And, um, they, but they basically, after examining him for a while, just say, eh, he's basically like a parrot. <laughs> you know, he's, he's not really a sentient creature. He just is a good mimic. So they give him a pole to perch on instead of a bed, treat him like a parrot. And finally, I guess he learns the language uh, well enough that they f some of them start to figure, wait a second, I think this guy actually is, you know, human, basically. One of the moon women fall in love with him. 
so goofy, your little bikini. And then he proclaims to everyone, he says, you know, your planet's just a moon. You think my Earth is the moon. No, we're a real planet. You're the moon. And everyone's shocked. And this is weird. As punishment, they give him this splendid robe, which is so beautifully designed, by the way. I love that. Very Art, art Nouveau. And then he's led to the center of the city where he, he basically recants what he said. God, look at that. That's so beautiful. And once again, everything is the opposite. They say, uh, yeah, you're going to be condemned to die of old age if you keep this up. You know, people who live a good life, they get a quick stab to the heart. But if uh, you kept saying that uh, bad shit, they would have let you live to a ripe old age. Which I guess that's the real punishment on this planet. Uh, parents obey their children on this planet. So it's kind of silly. There's two kinds of cities on Mars. There's uh, traveling towns and sedentary towns. The traveling towns, which uh, Cyrano de Bergerac happens to be in a house from one of those towns, they all got wheels and they set sail every now and then and just move, move the whole city. The sedentary towns, they have these giant screws and they just burrow into the ground for winter and come back out. And uh, they call him the doctor to inspect Cyrano. And he's like, but I'm not sick. And the doctor says, well, here's what the foods you should smell and uh, what kind of bed you should lie in. So this is supposed to be topsy-turvy, right? It's like, oh, they, call, they only call the doctor when you're not sick. But he says, on the moon, doctors are not paid to cure men, but to keep them in good health. So even though they're acting like this is totally opposite. It's like, oh, actually, that makes good sense. <laughs> That's preventive health care. But to Cyrano, it just seems like, oh, another crazy thing on the moon. Finally, he, he misses eating solid food. He tells uh, his hosts th this, and they go to hunt some birds. God, this crazy foliage. Just so designy. So apparently they have this uh, basically bullet or shell that not only kills all the bird in this, birds in the sky, but it plucks them, seasons them, and roasts them. So basically a bunch of nice chickens come down ready to eat. Oh man, nice colors. So basically just... The story continues like this. More crazy things. Everything's the opposite. And so the sun guy, um, when Cyrano wakes up the next day, Cyrano, uh, the sun guy says, hey, I know you want to return home. Do you want me to bring you home? I can do that. And he grabs him in his arms and leaps into the sky and takes him to earth, drops him on a hill very roughly right outside Rome. And uh, when he, as the guy flies off, he's cursing him. God, look at this amazing, this is almost like the most beautiful thing in the whole comic. Just P. Greg Russell spent all this time designing this beautiful font for the end. It's incredible. Next, we have Scott Hampton, uh, another fully painted comic. Um, this is very different for Scott Hampton. Um, you know, the, he always usually fully paints his comics, but this is very cartoony. He rarely draws like this. Gotta say, I'm not thrilled with it. I was, you know, I saw Scott Hampton in the contents. I was like, oh, yeah. But after seeing the story, I'm like, eh. I mean, this guy's got such, he's so skillful at painting, though. Really good. This is just like a funny autobio story. 
Scott Hampton's introducing himself as a cartoonist. And, you know, just talking what, about, like, when he was a little boy, how much he loved to draw. And now that he's a working artist, he finds that it's a lot harder to find time to draw. He procrastinates a lot. He even talks about the music he listens to when he draws. And one of the guys he listens to, he really likes, is John Renborn, who I've never heard of. He's an English guitarist, apparently. And I guess John Renborn's going to be in his plane his town in a few days. He calls up one of his best friends, says, get on a plane. You, you and your wife got to come out here. John Renborn's actually playing here. They call up their mutual friend, George Pratt, um, a great cartoonist. Uh, if you know Scott Hampton, you probably know who George Pratt is. They're uh, both very painterly artists. And, um, but George Pratt says, oh, I'm working on this enemy's graphic novel. I got to finish it. I can't come. So uh, they all kind of make fun of him because they know that George Pratt's a pretty big procrastinator too. He's a big goof off. So like, oh, come on. You know you can come down for a day or two. But he, he won't budge. So they go to the concert. It's amazing. He's great. And then on top of that, they, they sneak backstage and get to meet John Renborn. And Scott Hampton makes a fool of himself. Total fanboy. But he finally uh, calms down enough to talk to the guitarist. And his wife tells John Renborn that, she's like, hey, my husband's a cartoonist. And he writes his address down. He says, oh, you should send me some of them. I'd love to see some of these new comics. I only know Dan Dare from my childhood. So, of course, the next day, uh, Scott Hampton calls up George Pratt and leaves a message. And we see George Pratt listening to it. And he's just totally, not only bragging about what happened, but totally gilding the lily and uh, exaggerating. Talking about how he picked up a guitar and jammed with John Renborn. And they swapped a few licks. And how uh, he gave him his address and basically said, come visit me anytime in England, which he really didn't do. And of course, George Pratt is all like, damn, I should have went. Pretty goofy, but kind of nice art. Not nearly as nice as just Scott Hampton's normal style. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not done. I forgot. Yeah, no biggie. Just more of him talking about being an artist. This one's very strange. It's called Fanciable Headcase. It's uh, by Ilya. Um, the cartoon is known as Ed Hillier, or vice versa. Um, it says word Simon. So I think this is, by the way the, the captions go, I think this is a song lyric that he illustrated. I don't know. Maybe it's a Duran Duran. Maybe it's Simon the Bond. I don't know. And uh, it's basically about this total macho kind of pretty boy guy who's just kind of like a sexist pig who goes to clubs and hits on women. And he's very conceited, very full of himself. And uh, he's basically telling all these women, don't you want to go home with me? And then one of the women, you know, a bunch of women walk away and like, fuck you, you prick. But some, you know, fall for his line. And we see the first one that does leaves the bar with him. He, like, starts beating her up. And I guess it's implied he rapes her. But, so basically we just find out this guy's just a total horrible misogynist piece of shit. But never seems to have to pay consequences for it. Just gets away with it. Keeps picking up women and abusing them. Very strange little comic. Really kind of interesting colors. Very different than uh, a lot of colorists would do. I think uh, Ed Hillier does his own colors on this. I'll double check. Yeah, he does. Oh, here we got Roger Langridge. Frankenstein meets Shirley Temple. I love this cartooning. It's so fucking sharp. That's the only word I can think to describe it. Just sharp as a fucking tack. And uh, really nice colors, which I assume he does the colors too because it doesn't credit a colorist. And this is just a very silly comic. It's just Frankenstein and Shirley Temple floating through space, kind of 
spouting semi-philosophical things and kind of absurdist humor. Very strange. And they end up at this diner. <laughs> so I don't know about the, the narrative content of the strip. It's just really nice to look at. And then we have this thing by Steve White, Wonderful Life. And this is just a total thing about the blue whale. Just gives us all these facts about the blue whale. I mean, the main intent of this is to let us know that they're being hunted to extinction. And uh, really nice painting, I guess. But I think this was almost like a public service announcement. It's not like they were like, we got to get Steve White to do one of his whale paintings. They just wanted to uh, bring this to light. And there's the back cover with that unknown cartoonist. So uh, I wish I could find a credit for it. So he does all those dinosaur illustrations on the end papers. So there you go, guys. A new era of A1. A1, volume two, book one. There's only uh, four of these total. So we're coming close to the end of our coverage of A1. But uh, still some really nice stuff. It's definitely not as uh, star-studded as the first you know, six uh, atomic issues. But uh, pretty damn nice. And... Uh, Pretty interesting, weird stories. Um, like a lot of A1s, the the art is uh, definitely takes a uh, front seat to the stories. The A1 actually did have some really good writers. So I'm hoping the, the writing gets a little better in the next one. But, oh, man, the art is top-notch on this. So hope you guys enjoyed looking at it with me. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pettix Academy of Comic Book Studies.